I don't know about you, but that's a little bit of the picture we were sold initially. I looked into his eyes, like now my heart is beating fast, but that's because I'm nervous, but it's also because I'm looking at you. I remember how he smelt. We touched and I felt electric waves go through my body in places that I never thought existed. Come on, now don't be all spiritual on me and judge the female pastor standing on the stage because you all know what I'm talking about. We could not keep our hands off each other. Is that Pastor Mewe? You heard me. <laughs> Hallelujah. The female pastors are charged up. There was a connection. There was fire. We couldn't breathe. Now let's quickly fast track five years into this. We happily married, right? We have two kids. He's got a demanding job. I'm a pastor here at Rayma. We are on call. Then there's the in-laws. Then Pastor Alan wants help in something. Everyone wants something. And the first thing that we start to sacrifice, the first thing that we give up is the connection. So from the moment of not being able to keep our hands off each other with all the demands, with all the pressure, with everything that wants to take and take and take, we volunteer our connection. We volunteer to give up our intimacy. We both are sitting dissatisfied, frustrated, resentful, have unfulfilled needs upset with one another not feeling safe in the marriage anymore come on i don't know who might be there but i've been there sometimes my husband has been there sometimes and the question is and don't raise your hands how many of you who are married are right there right now It's not what we signed up for. So there's two definitions of intimacy. Let us first define intimacy from a world perspective. You see, the world is always constantly imprinting on us, reframing us, conditioning us, and bombarding our sensory portals wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we look at, whatever we listen to, whoever we with. Come on, every single time we with someone, listening to something, watching something, it's imprinting on us, rewiring us, reframing our references. And if we do not protect our sensory portals, what happened? We have a worldview perspective on intimacy, a worldview perspective on what sex is. What are some of the things that gives us this corrupted view? Let's talk about social media. We see the casualness of things. We see how superficial things is. Kimya, which is Kim Kardashian and Kanye showing a beautiful selfie. And we think, oh my goodness, one day, Rakesh, you and I, we're going to be all intimate like that. That is what we emulate. That is what the world teaches us because that's all we want to invest ourselves into. A false reality. We then have perversion. Easy. The other day, well, it was last year, we put in Farm Girl because we had a school project for my daughter. That was the biggest mistake I ever did, Pastor Allen, because here comes a cowgirl with a hat and boots and she was topless. I'm like, no, I actually really meant like a cowgirl who lives in a farm, you know, that type of thing. It is so easily accessible. Every single thing that we do, we know that we can, I mean, some of you may have really enjoyed Game of Thrones. The truth of the matter is it's a bunch of orgies. It's a bunch of people that's showing manipulation and power over someone else. And then again, perverts what God had created. But we think it's okay because we think it's innocent. It's just a TV series. And I'm not standing here judging anyone. I'm actually saying that every time you open yourself up to something, it deposits something into your life. And because of that, you start to reframe what you know is truth. 
Then we start to objectify. So now we tell me, have you seen those liquid food ads? Come on. Now, Preston, what does a woman eating a peach dripping? Come on. You know those ads with a bikini. She's drenching in that fruit. Now, Preston runs out and he wants to go and buy. Give me every single peach liquid fruit on that shelf because sex sells. We put a woman on a bike. Come on. I mean, I haven't seen much men on a bike, but it is starting to happen. But you put a woman on a bike with her legs stretched apart, and suddenly I want one of those Harley Davidsons. Do you really want a Harley? Or do you want that what comes with the Harley? What about other things that distort parental influences? No, 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 no. I'm taking you for etiquette and eloquence classes because a real woman crosses her legs and a real man behaves in this way and you're a gentle woman and then they want to raise prunes but when you get married then the woman doesn't know or the man doesn't know what to actually do because we've been told by our parents how we must behave and how a girl should behave and how, what we should do and how forthright we need to be but we have no clue again of what God wants for it. It becomes taboo, culture, taboo. Schools, they teach us. Again, it's a worldview. Sex is about either you have protected sex. If you don't, you're going to end up with HIV or unwanted pregnancy. Now you tell me, has that not redesigning our very thoughts of what God intended sex for? Sometimes there's a person that's gone through physical abuse, sexual abuse, that has totally distorted what God had created and reframed what actual intimacy is about. So we have all these walls that's been put up and all these protective barriers, and it's, it's a dirty thing, it's a horrible thing, it's a thing that causes me pain. We have self-image issues because that is what has perverted what is supposed to be pure, good, and innocent. I don't know about you, but we are in this world. We're not off this world. So I said this, there's what's false, there's what's fact, and then there's the word of God, which is what's truth. What is the biblical view? And we see in Genesis 2, 23 to 25, and God talks about this, you are Bone, he's, I mean, this is now Adam and Eve, and he's like, bone off my bone, flesh off my flesh. And he said, she will be called woman because she's taken from the man. That's why this man will leave his mother and father and be joined, and the two shall be one flesh. They were naked. They felt no shame. Because marriage and intimacy was designed and created by God. So God is the initiator, which then puts him in the position of becoming the covenant keeper. Bone of my bone, there is such a closeness. There is such a vulnerability that they had in the garden. There was nothing, no veil, nothing to hide. It was, you see everything of me physically and what's on the inside, and I see you. That was God's perfect picture. But you see this. Whatever God creates, because the enemy cannot create, right? So what God creates, the enemy can do second best. He has to distort. And what does he distort? He provides us with a forbidden fruit and tempts us. And then we either believe what the Lord had said about the fruit or what God had say, said, uh, the Lord had said, or the liar has said about the fruit. Did God really say you cannot have that? You shouldn't touch that? How many of us sitting here faced with situations where God explicitly like, mm -mm, that's going to lead to danger. Don't look at that. I know it's pleasing to the eye. But if you touch that, there's, you're going to experience a death. Not necessarily like in Genesis 2, a physical death, but a spiritual death. So sin enters in Genesis 3 verse 7. So when there was nothing to hide, now we're naked. We, we have to cover. That broke intimacy. 
the pure picture of what the Lord had, God had wanted. They wanted to be covered and, and no, because now suddenly that which was unified, we different. It brought corruption, perversion, shame. Because the enemy came to kill, to steal, to destroy. But whoever the son has set free is free indeed. And at the cross, that curse was broken because Jesus has given us victory over that sin so that intimacy can be restored in the beauty that he created it and initially designed it for. Everything has to have boundaries. I know it's not good. Boundaries are for our protection. I want to read here 1 Corinthians. And I don't know where's my slide. And it talks about, Paul is talking here. And, he's, and they were questioning him. Because Paul is addressing some of the parameters that comes to the privilege of marriage. I want to I wanna talk about this here. Such a beautiful thing. But how many, how many know that this has caused so much of heartache, brokenness, loneliness, resentment? Can I tell you perhaps why? Because this represents passion. Passion has purpose. Purpose needs to be confined to parameters. And the parameters that God has designed is the marriage bed. So this analogy here is a set of logs. It represents a passion which is fire. Passion which is not contained becomes problematic. So we're supposed to be, you see, God says, I have made it for the marriage bed. Therefore, I stand, stand as the covenant keeper and it's my responsibility to actually be on God surrounding this two flesh that has become now one. So when you light the fire in your marriage with your spouse where I intended it to be, then I'm in charge of keeping this fire contained. The same fire that burned so many things in Neisner in Australia. You see, because it was not contained. The same one that can warm you up a little bit in your house and make you a bit warm, can destroy wildlife, can destroy people, that's what happens when this passion is taken outside. When I start to take the fire and I start to experiment with a guy at work because, hey, you sexy thing, I, I like that talk that you gave and the little dance you did with boys to men and it was not to promote their show that's happening in a few days' time. <laughs> but if you go and light a little fire outside of that, you can then go and light a little fire here. You play with fire, you're going to get burnt. But I know the word of God that says he's an all-consuming fire. But we're busy lighting fires all around outside. And then we go to the Lord and we say, I need help. I'm desperate. I am in huge mess. My family's falling apart. I'm broken on the inside. I'm empty on the inside because I gave myself to things and to places that I shouldn't have in the first place. Now we are broken and destroyed. God does it for our own safety. This bed is where he says, I will stand God over this. Because he's not going to control the little fires. They will be lighting all over. That's where it needs to be. Because sin introduced sexual immorality. Therefore, God has to stand God. Paul identifies in the scripture that both spouses have needs and that the marriage bed can satisfy both of them. What is due to them? You see, we think it's a hierarchy. One spouse feels like, you know what? My job here is just to satisfy him or just to satisfy her. Do you know as a pastor how many people that we counsel and women have never reached an orgasm? Because they just, I need to satisfy him, my job is done, we're gone. So we sit back and we want to be satisfied. When Paul refers, and keep the scripture up please, when Paul refers to this, he's talking about equally 
mutually having equality in the bedroom he talks about serving one another that you know what leave me out of this because in satisfying you and your needs and being intimate with you and your desires i in turn satisfy myself because we're supposed to actually mirror is that not what christ did serve the church but we lie there and we want our spouses to just satisfy me and when we're done and we're satisfied who cares When we deny our spouses, come on, how many people hear the headaches? Oh, I just got a headache. <laughs> She's always sick. I mean, like, you're always sick. Really? Now, I'm, I'm so exhausted today. I got that meeting. I, ca I can't, babe, not now, please. Really? You are defrauding your spouse that which God intended for you to serve. It's a blessing. It's not a chore. But we're too tired. It's like it feels like a curse. You walk in disobedience when you keep on refusing your spouse. It's the truth. Unless there's a valid reason you terminally ill, there's something that's really going on. But if you're constantly falling back on your crutch and saying no, there's an issue there. The marriage bed is to value one another. It's to serve one another. It's to satisfy one another. It is to connect with one another. But then you need to be true what's affecting your connection because we all have excuses. Many times we feel we cannot express ourselves in a safe environment, so we use exits as an avoidance tactic. And think about that in your own lives. An exit is any behavior or activity that allows us to reduce or avoid involvement in our relationship. The enemy to connection is an exit as it drains energy and the life from the relationship. It redirects the person to start using crutches like an exit and think about your own life, your cell phone, work, the kids, these are some of the things that we start to use as exit. And then you need to ask yourself, is my intimacy with God firstly misplaced? Am I intentional with my spouse? Am I present? Am I conscious in my relationship? Has my relationship with my spouse and husbands and wives and those who are intending to get married, you need to be intentional about this has it become functional are you on autopilot how many of us are dissatisfied our tanks are running so low we are on autopilot but a good friend of mine said this that like your bank account you don't make any investments into it in any deposits don't think you're ever going to get any withdrawals You need to find out what is some of the ways that I use and the things that I use to avoid my spouse. And you can start by saying the exit I use is evolving my life around the busyness with the kids. When the core pain that I'm trying to avoid by using this exit is feeling rejected. Sometimes we feel so rejected because we're unsatisfied, dissatisfied, that avoidance is better than the feeling of rejection. Ask yourself this, by using this exit, I sacrifice my deeper need of what? What are you sacrificing? Connection? We all know that there's some hindrances and foxes that come to steal this, right? Let's talk about pornography. Because these are hindrances to intimacy. You know, we think that it's very innocent. We counsel people as pastors and say, we're just playing around. It's a little carrot that we're just dangling and you know, we're just, we just messing around, you know? It's nothing hard, it just gets us going. 
it may seem cute and innocent in the beginning, but that short-term pleasure that you're trading off is long-term satisfaction and you're actually introducing a long-term destruction into your relationship because it's not just spicing things up. You actually put yourself in a hole that you prevent yourself from ever being connected to an actual person. Porn is based on self-satisfaction. It is lust. It is not true intimacy. The, the, the main thing to pawn is not to give, it is to receive. It stops and bypasses any intimate connection or bond with a real person. It rewires the brain and leaves destructive impressions. It reframes your reference and becomes addictive. Even though you said temporarily, I'm finding it's just one time, Pastor. Actually, it was just the second time and the third time. Before you know it, you cannot even get an erection with your partner because of the fact that you're so used to the shot of adrenaline that you get because your brain, th your, your brain thinks that this is the only way to get my juices flowing. What it does is that it undermines your spouse. It devalues them. It makes your spouse think, hey, there's, there's something wrong with me. I, I think it's the way I'm built. It's not, it's not good enough. And then we want our spouses to do some things that the porn addicts do. And we like, you know, we want something. And sometimes it's innocent. The guys or the girls just send us something because we're in a boys chat group or the girls chat group. And next minute we, we find ourselves actually getting aroused by it. And then when we come home and we expect our wives or our husbands to be able to bend and twist their bodies with that when there was camera and filters and all of that and here we have her breasts that are so perky and up here and I come home to my bed and I see my wife's breasts are touching the bed but she had four kids. That's some 18 year old who's acting. And many times, those that are acting, do you know that you sometimes prescribe to people who are, have been human trafficked? They haven't even given their, their consent, but they're there and they fear for their lives. And if they don't, then acid's going to be poured on the entire family and they're going to die. So they have no other choice but to take off all their clothes and put on an act so some of us, you and I, can be satisfied by that and give it an airing. They are kids. This industry has kids that this happens to you. And we prescribe to this because our entertainment sometimes is someone else's death. We masturbate. You know what, she's always got a headache or he's always just working so I'll, I'll buy myself um, a little toy and I'll just have to do it on my own. I don't need to think about him. I don't need to. I, 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 I just, I, I just want to feel pleasure. I cut him off completely. Or you know what? I need to just masturbate because if I do that, then you know it just relieves some tension. Why don't you speak to your spouse and say you're stressed? Speak to your spouse and say, babe, I need to connect right now because it helps me with my stress. We think sex is a man thing. Women have also evolved. Maybe they haven't been given the mic or a platform them to air their feelings and they've been seen as objects. But if you actually speak to many women, if you valued and if you feel connected and loved, you also have needs that you want satisfied. I, I remember this one time Pastor Allen was telling us the story. He had the bubble bath running for Pastor Shana. I mean, he put on not even boys to men. I mean, he, he, he was going full out. You remember that time, Pastor Allen, right? The bubble bath. I mean, I don't know why he told us that story, but I think it was, he just told us everything. And here he's like, put the rose petals, and Pastor Shana was coming out, the dim, the music, the kids were sleeping. I mean, it was a perfect setting, right? Little did he know that the little fox, which is called his child, little Simon, Daddy, Daddy, I mean, come on, Simon, can you not see that mom and I are about to get, come on, what is going on, Pastor? Do you, do you get that? 
children are a blessing from God, but we, we've got a little uh, uh, thing. My husband and I, we, my second child, she like just knows when things are about to happen. She wants to present herself at that very moment. So we've got a little nickname, which I cannot say on stage because I'm a pastor. <laughs> but children do that. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, what about the fact that, oh, my time's running out. Let's talk about age-related things that happen, okay? Things like she has had two children. Her body's not the same anymore. Come on, woman. You pushed out those massive babies through there. Okay, all our muscles start to weaken, even our vaginal muscles. If there's children here, my apologies. There we go. Can you hear? That child's not happy. He's like, she looked happy when she pushed me out. <laughs> okay, so her body has changed. But we feel the pressure, and I need to appeal to women tonight. You know what? Not only has your vagina stretched, but the truth of the matter is, his penis is not as hard as it used to be when he was in his 20s. He's not a stallion anymore. It's not as thick and as long and as wide as you know it to be. So if we come on, church, we're here to preach about sex. So women, stop doing 50 kegel exercise squeeze squeeze because you know what you need to go and do all your stitches so that you can satisfy him it's do you need to understand that you are growing and aging together and if he's aging you aging and if you aging he's age so stop feeling the pressure that you need to be this this person that has to and start recognizing tell him baby you've also aged Take the pressure off yourself. Now, I'm not saying let yourself go and, and don't, don't, don't do squats. What I'm trying to say is that it's an equal responsibility to bring equal pleasure into the bedroom. But we feel that if I don't do this, he's going to cheat on me. So I, I just like have to go and have myself stitched up. No, stop it. Stop it. He's aged. So have you. Things like mental health. Someone who's on antidepressants, your libido is not as high as it used to be. Things like um, if you have erectile problems, you need to address those things. If you have lubrication issues because of menopause or whatever the case may be, those are discussions that we need to have. Sometimes there may be a fox called adultery that has taken place and you need to go for counseling because there's trust issues and you cannot express yourself because you don't feel safe. You need to go and have those discussions. So then, what is the solutions? We need to involve God. No one takes a Ford. We had an issue with our car recently. No one takes the Ford and go to Audi. Okay, now I understand the need for, 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 for going to certain places, but the first and foremost priority in all our lives is take it back to the creator. We separate what was being created and designed from the designer and the artist. Take it back, involve God, take communion. Open communication. If you don't like where he's touching, you redirect his hand to all your hot spots. Stop sitting there so dissatisfied and just hoping that you know what, he'll get it or you're angry, you're building up anger. If she's not doing what she needs to do and you need her to do more of what you like her to do, so instead of fantasizing about it out there, say we need to have a discussion because this I need to talk to you about. This is what I like. This is the touch that I like. This is what, you know, you do this all the time and it, actually I feel nothing. Come on. You know, you know, he always comes on the military position or the missionary position and you're like, baby, can we just try something else like another style i think the kama sutra is from india adele <laughs> flirt throughout the day 
You can't just come at 11 o'clock and be like, come on, you know what, let's just get it on. And, and she's tired or he's tired. And, and you guys haven't even spoken or chatted or said you sexy thing or anything the whole day. Now suddenly we're in bed, come on. And then you just like, like make movements because you, you know, in bed. And then the other one pretends like they're sleeping because if I show him that I'm awake, then that means, no, 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 no. You know what? No. I'm not the only one. Okay, be creative. You are connected to the all creative God. Ask him, Lord, this one is getting a little bit boring on this end. What can I do to add, to change? I mean, come on, Lord. He's the creator. He's going to tell you which way your body can bend and which way it can't. <laughs> He's going to say, you haven't even discovered quarter of what it still can happen. But why are we scared to take this to God or to talk to each other or to explore this area with our spouses? Be intentional. Part of the solution to build up intimacy. Go on dates. Okay? We try to go once a week, either to the movies. He loves movies. We try to go and uh, have breakfast once a week just to connect. We don't talk about the kids. We don't talk about the school fees. We don't talk about the homework. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about what's happening here at Rayma or what he's, he's doing in his job. We just connect. We try to flirt. I try to look cute a little bit. You know, I try to twirl my hair. He's like, baby, what's wrong? Is something wrong with your eyes? <laughs> I'm like, baby, like that, that is my sexy look. He forgot what my sexy look, you know? So I'm like sitting there like, and he's like, is there something wrong? Do you need to go to the emergency room? Like, dude. Romance, set the scene. Do what Pastor Allen did when the kids out deep sleep. Okay, do the bubble bath. Come on, make an effort. Things just don't happen. Oh no, she's not trying. Now, why must I bother? No, you make the effort. You want it. You make the effort. You serve. You heard what Paul said. Holiday breaks, try to go out at least once a year, twice a year, just you two for a weekend. Find cheap and effective ways. No kids, no in-laws, no work, no emails, no cell phone, you and me. And you know what? Try not to take a lot of clothes. Stay naked as often as you can. I just came back from my birthday weekend, baby. We stayed naked as often as we could. That's overshare, overshare, overshare. You need to know. Okay, get babysitters, be transparent, intervene, medication, there's lubrication that you can use, there's hormone supplements, there's remedies, there's stimulants, there's things now that's out in the market called an O-shot. It helps to concentrate all the blood vessels so that you can reach an orgasm and climax quickly, a P-shot. It's helping with erections these days and it helps with blood flow. There is so many things, there's counseling. Have accountability partners if you're into porn. Speak to your pastor, get to someone that can help you. These interventions, unless we don't want it, Where's my slides? My slides are not here, guys. You see, there's that all the C's. Where's the C's? The last slide? There's all the C's there. Because we cannot change the past. But we can start a new chapter with a happy ending. Today, my challenge to you, who's willing to bring the F back into their marriage? What is the F? Okay, don't, don't say if your mind is faulty. Um, yeah, right. Could confuse a few people, right? Okay, bring the fun back into your marriage. Put that apron on if you need to. Bring out the feathers for the tick. Do what you need to do, but God is not a boring God and it's time to bring the F back into your marriage. Thank you. Any questions? Um, good evening, everyone, and good evening, Pastor Devani. Thanks for your message. Um, this is quite a funny message, so thank you. My question to you is, why did 
God make sex? I think we, we're talking about sex, but why did God make sex? I think sex can be something that's very pleasurable and fun, but how come it's, why, why did God make sex pleasurable and fun? So my questions to you are, why did God make sex and why is there like pleasure and fun in it? You answered part of it. The first thing is that, the first thing is that actually to procreate. That's one of the reasons, okay? Adam and Eve, he said, multiply. That's one of the reasons for the rest of humanity to continue. Okay, that's one reason. The second reason is that it's a full picture and image of God. I consider it as worship. When two people are truly connecting and giving themselves fully to one another, I believe it's a beautiful picture. And I'm not saying if you're single that you're not representing God in any way, but I do, do believe that it's a beautiful picture represent the closeness that God created between two human beings. Some people are called to be single, and the Lord has called them for that, and that's his will for their lives. Those that he called to be married do have that, and there is fun and there is pleasure in that as well. Anyone else? Good evening, everyone. I'm asking for a friend now. No yeah. judging. I, I heard you talking about the, I don't know, the things like whatever to boost the erection and everything. So I feel like it's a double standard. Um, what about the, the vibrator, vibrator, um, and the other things where you said it replace, replaces your partner somehow, undermines him. And then, but on the other side, you're using things like boosters to boost whatever on the... So, how do you strike the balance there for a friend? Okay, please make sure you tell the friend very nicely what we're about to say now. Don't leave out parts, okay? All right. So, with that, I didn't advocate that we have to have certain enhancers. I just want to make that very clear, okay? But we spoke about going back to the creator, which is God, which is your core, your compass, your plumb line, who actually gives you the conviction of what's permissible in your marriage, what's not. The truth of the matter is that the scripture does not say vibrators are allowed, vibrators are not. Am I correct? Am I reading my Bible correctly? Okay, the Bible does not say that. So the Bible is silent on that. So... You need to be connected to the Holy Spirit. What is a conviction that will work in your relationship? What, so as long as it does not make the other come uncomfortable, as long as it does not break any convictions that's within, because when it is, you're not supposed to. We cannot prescribe to you and say, you are not allowed to do this, you are not allowed to do that. That is a conviction because the married bed is undefiled. A husband and wife together before God, which includes the Holy Spirit, and God is actually standing God over the marriage bed, will give that couple conviction and a prescriptive of what works for them, what does not work for them. So there's many ways without involving toys that you can still spice up your relationship. And for those who are contemplating that, that is a question that only the conviction of the Holy Spirit can give you and your partner. Wow, not many questions. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think that's it. Okay.